Templar. Have you ever played the epic day-long Game of Thrones board game and thought to yourself, oh, this is very good, but maybe it would be better if it only lasted an hour and didn't cause all of my friends to be emotionally scarred? Well, if you did, then good news. That's exactly what the designer of A War of Whispers thought. And the great news is they succeeded because it's exactly what this game feels like. Now, whoa, 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 whoa. hold on a second. I know what you're thinking here. How can this game of wooden cubes on a board possibly compare to the smorgasbord of marbled plastic that comes in the big box beauty that is Game of Thrones. Well, the loudest voice doesn't always have the last word. And in the War of Whispers, you win or you The crucial difference between War of Whispers and other area control games like Game of Thrones the board game is that these armies on the board, well, you'll be shifting them around and fighting with them and reinforcing them, but you don't directly control them, you might not even like them. So rather than putting you in the thick, muddy boots of royal families clomping around the land trying to collect the most real estate, this unusual war game sees you playing as the spies, the figures just behind the curtain, making sure that they only get their hands dirty when no one else is watching. Are you familiar with Lord Varys, the ultimate big lad of knowing cool secrets? Well, that's you, that is. <laughs> Send word to the Crimson Army that the armies to the east remain completely undefended in their castle. <laughs> Let them throw themselves against a wall of arrows, leaving both sides to their demise. Raven! <laughs> Carry this message post haste. <laughs> and who are these factions you're going to be brutally manipulating throughout the game? There's a lot of subtle variants here, especially in the central area. Loads of fantastic castles in the middle of the board, but enemies on all sides. Meanwhile, people in the north have no castles. If they want to try and win, they're going to have to do some serious invading. But they also have the best capabilities to both defend themselves and reinforce their armies. It's all very subtle stuff, but don't get too hooked up with all that stuff because that is not who you're going to be playing as. Players will instead get to choose one of the shady, creepy, crawly factions, such as the Supplicant Spider, the Pale Raven, the Endless Serpent, or the Cult of the... Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to tell you about this. The Cult of the Rat! <laughs> At the start of the game, you're going to shuffle around your five faction tokens on your player board and peek at them to see who you'd ideally like to win the wall, who you'd like to almost win it, who you hope is still alive to some extent, and finally, the faction that you literally don't care about at all, and the people that you quietly hope will all die. I really hope they all die! Do, 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 do. There are four rounds in the game which zoom by with alarming speed, in which you're each going to place a couple of tokens somewhere on this ring of things. And each of these represents an action that are then going to play out in sequence, completing the round. Each space does something slightly different, and some of them allow you to choose one of two actions, but it's always something simple. You can train more troops, mount an attack, or take action cards from that faction's pile. But it's the fourth space on each faction's slice of the wheel pie where things start to get interesting. Here, one of the actions allows you to swap your token with another from that section and instead carry out that action. And the last juicy morsel of rules here is that if there's ever any free spaces to the left of a place token within that section, you get to do all of those actions for free. So if I place a command token on the fourth and final slot of the blue army, and then nobody else during that round fills up any of the other slots, well, that means I get three free actions, four actions for just one token. That's an incredible bit of economizing until somebody inevitably puts down a token in the third slot and then I just get one action and they get three. Once all of the tokens are in place, you whip around this circle of things with each player taking in turns 
to take their actions, eliciting a chorus of mmms and ahs as everyone tries to suss out the allegiances of these mysterious other players. And after that, you do it three more times, and that's the whole game. It goes around remarkably quickly. The interesting thing is from the second round onwards, before you take it in turns to put new tokens on the board, which stay in place for the whole game, you'll first remove one of your tokens from the board, deciding which army or which bit of control you're no longer interested in. For some of these games alliances, you're gonna be dipping your toe in and out like an indecisive jacuzzi baby, but most of the time for the first half of the game, wherever the tokens get placed on the board, it's gonna be where most of them are at the end of the game. So when it comes to looking out for your favorite BFF top forever army, you really don't have time to be playing your cards too close to your chest. Speaking of which, Tom, what do you think of this game? I couldn't say really. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Quite. Well, at least we're having the, you know, the, mm. the fascinating conversation. Do you like it? What do you think? Well, <laughs> well, it's a very interesting uh, topic to think about, isn't it? Yeah, no, I would. Yeah. Hmm. Of course. No. Yeah. Well, it is. It's. It's a very interesting. Intriguing. Go on. Questionable. Oh, me. I think it's. You yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. You know. You know. I'm not entirely sure where that boy's interests lie. A game of War of Whispers doesn't contain many major surprises. It's very quickly evident that you're in the pocket of big green. I want the blue boys of the Nerf to do incredibly well in this war. Everyone can kind of tell that. But being a winner in a game like this isn't about backing the lion, the wolf, or the wardrobe that wins the war. It's about being on good terms with whoever comes second in the war. The vassal states, who comes third? And sometimes that means changing your mind. Change of plans promised the skin of your family to make mittens. Lots of love. Ah, yes. How much extra is it to have it tracked? At the end of the first three rounds of the game, each player gets an opportunity to switch the allegiance tokens on their board, but in doing so, has to reveal them. But don't worry, it's not that big a deal. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's certainly better than flogging a dead dragon in a war that you're flat out losing. It's not unusual to see most of the players around the table wanting the same faction to win by the end of the game. And this alternative framing of a war makes for a game where yeah, when you inevitably decide that someone's friendship is no longer useful and stab them in the back, it's not actually a real person around the table who's getting betrayed. They're fake people inside the board, locked in a permanent struggle where they bend to the wills of unseen figures, pushing them to and forth. Why do they fight? They know only violence. It is no longer their will to fight, but their purpose. Without war, they are nothing. Nothing but cubes. So you're constantly watching all the other players like hawks, trying to unpick the exact meaning of their moves and alliances, but you're not actually ever gonna be betraying other people or lying to their faces about things in ways that will hurt them. And on the topic of honesty, I think it might be time for me to reveal exactly how I feel about this- no! Before you can disparage this beautiful game with your vile words, I will reveal what I think of this game. I think it is brilliant. I think it's, I was gonna say that, I think it's brilliant as well. Oh, sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to- We have the same, we have the same thing. You sorry, didn't have yeah. to do that, we were on the same team. You, you didn't have to push me off the chair. Well, I feel really bad now. The thing about this game is, it's not really about who you're opposing, it's more about the times in which you're actually on the same side. You see, much of War of Whispers isn't about looking for fights, but looking for places where you don't have to fight because somebody else wants the same things that you do. Like, if it's quite obvious that you're rooting for the Red Army just as much as me, then I'm not gonna be putting down my tokens to compete with you when I could just be putting them somewhere else. And you know, 
you're already completely looking after the Yellow Army. So fantastic. I don't need to do anything over there. Wait, why are they throwing all of the Yellow Army into a fortified castle and wiping out everyone at once? Oh, gosh. That wasn't supposed to... Wheels within wheels. The thing about this game is it's not about who is at the end of either side of your sheet. It's all about the positioning of the factions in the middle. Yes, we both want the Red Army to thrive, but do you want them to beat the yellows or the blues or the greens because I've got a slightly different order maybe and so much of the game is about unpicking this subtle puzzle looking for ways that by the end of the game you can have one or two more points than other people just because the setup of your allegiance will be exactly the same but maybe two tokens the other ways around and that's enough to lose or win the game. And looking for these minor ways to tweak the balance of power really kicks into overdrive at the point at which you use the advanced rule in the manual, which allows you to place a command token on a location on the board, making that little slice of the map count as a city for scoring purposes at the end of the game, which might be huge, but only for the player whose token is there. And other players can join in. Another player can be like, yeah, sure, I'm going to put a token in the same place so it counts as a city for me as well. But the crucial thing is, if you then lose control of that location, it goes to another army, then maybe that's not as good for you, or maybe it's just straight up bad. And instead of getting you an extra four points at the end of the game, it's going to be minus one point. Gah! Honestly, this game is phenomenal. A speedy cyclone of cunning and wits, a game where knowledge is power that you only give away begrudgingly in the event that you are otherwise completely shafted. This isn't a game of smashing up shields and armor with giant axes. This is fencing by moonlight. It's all footwork and care, dancing around each other, waiting for the perfect moment to make a decisive clean strike. And the deepest cuts here, well, they come with the way that you play cards. The powers here seem wild and unpredictable when you first draw a card. After your attack, you may make an additional attack with any surviving banners. Instead of using the current agent's position action, use a position action held by one of your other agents. And you're on the board, that's huge, that's crazy. But all of the cards in each of these five decks are almost identical. So after a couple of games, you reliably know exactly what a player can and likely will do with their cards. With three or four players, the excitement of these cards really shines. You only get to do a couple of big things during the game, and it becomes these really cool, exciting, pivotal moments. With two players, it becomes a little bit swingier and a little bit more mad, because with fewer people putting tokens on the board, the more people who are getting cards comparatively, it's a lot of pow, take that! It's still very fun, it's still very exciting. But as you might expect, the best sweet spot to hit with a game like this is about three or four players. Although it's worth mentioning with four, if you don't play with the advanced rule that lets you place tokens on the map instead of the ring, then by the very end of the game, the ring is utterly crammed and you don't really have many decisions to make there. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. A game that ends without the option for insane analysis paralysis at the very end. I'm not gonna lie, that sounds pretty, pretty sweet. But again, these differences between player counts, they're not a problem, it's not better or worse, it's just kind of different with different numbers of players. This is a game that takes 10 minutes to learn and teach, and is over in an hour, and plays well with two, three, and four players. What is this? Is it Christmas? Oh, apparently we just did Christmas. It's not Christmas, but it feels like Christmas. It's not. There's really not a great deal here that's not to love. Now, we talk a lot about games being bloated with components and bits and bobs, but here, the only real issue with the game is the fact that the cities and the towers and the granaries on the board, you need to be able to see them at all times and as they're just drawn on the board in the way that's really cool looking but maybe doesn't pop out, sometimes you have to shuffle around cubes to see what's underneath them. And that's not a huge deal breaker because you might check a space on the board for any myriad of reasons throughout the game. It's not gonna give away your tactics and strategies, but it would have been maybe better to have some little signifiers. And I think in the deluxe edition of the game, that's a thing, but we're not reviewing that, we're reviewing this. The only other thing I could say is it would have been cool if it had come in a smaller box. It's, it's already a pretty small box, but it could have fit into something a lot tinier than this. What's all this? It's got all this stuff. Like half of these bits don't have anything in them. And the things don't even fit in them. It doesn't, I don't know what this doesn't make. Doesn't quite make sense. Anyway, I 
I'm going to be penning a letter to the creators of this game, telling them that I don't like this game at all. <laughs> when in fact, I wholeheartedly recommend it. <laughs> Chaos is a stepladder. <laughs> Raven, take this letter to the publishers. Post haste, fly high, higher. Hi! No, no, I, I can't go any higher. Why? You do know how this works, right? Oh, not... No, not really. I mean, you, you make friends with a bird, and then... Look, look. Raven! Fly! Fly! Ha <laughs> ha! Can't really think of a satisfying way to, to put an ending to all of this, really. Something to tie up all the ends and make everyone feel like that was all rounded, nice, uh, a cohesive piece of work. It's me, Brandon Stark, with a satisfying end to the short up and sit down uh, video. Please like and subscribe to the video, and this video has been sponsored by uh, Stark Space. The if you wanted to make a website, but you can't because you're a bird and you don't have like fingers and thumbs and, and that, well, Stark Space. Thank you very much. Bye!